So I will talk today about uh, basically it's a bit about machine learning and a bit about patterns, but, but, but the idea is more or less it's related to the multiple sequence alignments we talked about last week. So how, how, how you remember that we talk, said that we could extract information by analyzing multiple sequence alignment. So we could say that this looks like a sheet, this looks like a helix, or this looks like uh, nothing else. So we can do this in a more computational view, and uh, it's uh, partly it's a bit of like how to do it in our database of that, which is like old patterns you can find. But uh, the whole idea is basically otherwise is at least introduction to the machine learning field. So machine learning is really the field where you uh, don't program a computer exactly what you should do, instead you try to teach it what to do. And it's been really impressive progress the last few years. So if I don't know if you missed that, but it was just I think last week when they introduced or Google reported a uh, computer program that could beat the European Championship of Go. So I, I don't know really Go, but the, 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 in comparison to what the chess that was beaten by computers 10 years ago or something like that, or 15 years ago. The, the, the difference is like Go is much more complicated, you got much more intuition, you can't really uh, enumerate all things. And it's particularly, it's very difficult to say if one, if, well, to say when you're winning before, if you're just by analyzing the board, you really need to have some kind of experience and look at it. Because in chess, you can say, the one that has most pieces, or the most valuable pieces is going to win. That's kind of easy. So you can you really say, okay, if I win one more piece of you, then that's what I'll do better. So you don't try to win pieces. But in, but in Go, somehow, so what it did there, if I, it's not like in chess, in chess basically you have your pieces and you try, okay, I try, what happens if I move this one here and this one can then move all possible, like move them in different ways. It's just enumerate all possibilities, which is a lot, so you can't do it forever, but you can, certainly the computer can do it much better than the human. But in Go, you have these black and white dots that are somehow connected and you should try Try to somehow extend them and turn them another way around. So what they did is that is that they actually just showed these images, just showed the patterns that they had there, and then they tried to learn what a good player did. So what, what did a good player put next strategy? So they basically they just tried to recognize patterns. They, they didn't really try to tell, ah, oh, this is a rule for a good pattern. Try to learn different things. Instead, they tried to teach them what has not been done before, and then it taught take artificial games on the, with itself on the computer and also with other computer programs and so on to try to improve the strategy. So what is, what is the, where should I put this next piece that I want to win? And then it used what is called a deep learning strategy. So it basically used very complicated artificial neural networks. That is something that's been very uh, advanced and lost, lost a lot, uh, lot the last few years. So this is an example where actually really Machines are getting better and better. And nobody really thought that this would be possible this soon. People decided, oh, I was always telling you in the future. But the, 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 the second best program is easily beaten by a good player. While today, chess, uh, you don't need a very powerful computer to beat everybody in the world. They just, they are uh, way much higher the rank of chess programs than they are than the best human players. So this is really well just and, and a key thing, there are two key problems, some computational aspects, but really the ability to handle very, very big data. So there are much, much more data than people had before. So I'm not so much talk about deep learning, because it's kind of a new thing, and we know it, it started to be used in biomatics, but we'll mainly talk about what the tra more traditional machine learning method. But the idea is the same, is that you have much more data, hundreds of thousands of millions of times more data. And also that there's a key difference is that the traditional machine learning methods is very often very important how you present the problem. So really you're trying to present the problem in a structured way. So you're trying to almost tell them the biology about your bioinformatics problem or something like that. But but, but in this case um, you really can um, the idea is that you can basically present the data in much less uh, organized way. So one, one way is image recognition. You can think you just present images. The classical problem is recognize cats on YouTube, which is the we, you must have pretty good at it. But 
if you, if you make it in an old traditional uh, machine language, you would like say, okay, we try to find something that looks like an eye, or like an ear, we try to find the, the shapes or something like that, and try to make some calculation to do that, and then present that to a computer program. While the more modern deep learning method basically takes a million times more images, and you have to say cat, no cat, cat, no cat. And then, then itself tries to recognize, ah, ears are important, or eyes are important, or whatever. Okay, so back to Protoss. Quick question. Yep. I guess you can turn that around as well, right? And say, here is our data. What's, what interesting correlations can you find here? There are, yes, you can. You can. I mean, it's called supervised to unsupervised learning. It's like, so this is what you call, we call that. Uh, not sure you can really do it with images, but you probably could categorize images in ways. So, like, I'm afraid, what, what do you do? I mean, everything you don't ca can't categorize, you try to work track them together, and then of course you, you say that these are somehow similar to each other, but we don't know what they are. So, so, so yeah, you, that's, uh, and you can try to find patterns that are important that I don't see, but it's, 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 at least it's easy to think about it when you know you want to recognize something you already know. Okay, so we can actually say that we actually can use multiple six alignments. He said, we only told we can use it for the detection of homologous proteins, this is Cyblast. Uh, Phylogenetic C, so we haven't talked about it, we'll talk about that tomorrow. And we can use profiles and hit the mark models, and the Cyblast is good, and Phylogenetic C, and that. But we can also use it for exact information. So, the, is the old type of thing is actually, it was way before machine learning, and even before most of the minds, that you find patterns and motifs, is sometimes called. So these are rules that someone has made up. There are even automatic methods to try to enumerate all these possible rules if you have a given set of sequences. So if you want, so for instance, you can have the rule for the signal peptidase that is serine active. You should have this amino acid sequence. First, first the proline, so an alanine, and then the glycine or serine, then something, then a serine, then a thiolene, something, proline, uh, alanine or threonine, and then leucine or phenylalanine. So this is very extremely pattern that has to match exactly that. In some cases you can have so you have C R to one of something or whatever, or you can have G and C. So then you have in the uh, nucleotide star site you can have this pattern there. And so there is databases that contain these kind of rules for many different things, from for gene for start site or for tata boxes or for catalytic sites and, and enzymes and so on. And these were for a long time used as the main functional categorization of proteins. So really you had new proteins. And of course, you can, you can th think about it. This is basically a non-statistical way of describing a multiple sequence alignment. If, you're, if you have, take all your signal peptidases, so that are in this plus size 0, 0, 5, 0, 1, and you do an alignment of this, and you find that this is the pattern that's kind of unique for this one. On the other hand, when the multiple sequence alignment gets very big, I'm sure there'll be one that has a three in here instead of zero. So you, you, these really exact rules are very hard to maintain. You really don't capture everything, and or maybe it's like here the glycine is extremely uh, serine can exist, but in 95% of the cases it's a glycine. So you want to so if you had a glycine pattern, you would want to be much more likely to describe that it's, it's a serine protease, serine peptidase than not. So there, there are. Uh, not always extremely strict, but otherwise the, the good thing is that you really have um, good. Uh, I mean, biology is describing this well. So single peptides, is, it was a traditional problem. The first method to find single peptides was basically using this kind of patterns. You say you want to have between ten and twenty amino acids. They were mainly hydrophobic, and you want to have this specific arginine that should be used for cleaving, etc. So you have specific patterns. So you said, it didn't find everything, but now. The new methods they use instead of using this multiple six alignments in a in a machine learning method or as a statistical method are significantly better. But anyway, this is often what you want to find in a protein. You want to find what's important. So one way that is important if you if you take your multiple six alignment is to visualize it. And this is often done what's called sequence logos. I think I think Gunnar showed some of this last Friday. So I think it's a very clever way to visualize. So multiple sequence alignment 
A lot of letters next to each other. And uh, if you have more than five or uh, ten lines in multiple six lines, it's very hard to see it. But what we want to look for is we want to look for the uh, positions that are conserved or mainly conserved. And the things that are a lot of vari variation to, we want to skip. We can ignore that part. So if you take each column, if you write all the letters you find in one column on top of each other, and you let the height of the letter correspond to the frequency. So if it's one position that's only system, it would only be big C and nothing else. If it's one position that is everything is mixed, you have 20% or 5% of every amino acid. All our leucines and the valines will have L and V. And if you then color them by some polarity or something like that, you're going to have nice colors patterns that you can see it. And then secondly, if you take the height of, of, of your letter, if that is how conserved it is, measuring the entropy and the information you have it. So if basically it's completely random, it's height zero. If it's completely conserved, it's height 4.2, so basically entropy in, in P square 2. You can visualize it quite nicely. So we want to calculate the information, which is given by the Shannon entropy. So basically you take the frequency and log, and log from the frequency, and then you have what is defined as entropy. The Shannon entropy, if you do it in, in the log of 2. Uh, so if this is... Uh, so basically you want, to, you want to compress things as much as possible, but... Um, uh, so basically, uh, yeah, you want to basically if it's it's a high number, if it's completely conserved, it's, it's basically it's zero, if it's completely random. So you can end up with something like that. This is a tata box. So here for, for amino acids, the log two or two max number is <coughs> two. So the A is in this case is completely conserved. So you have four sequences. So you have, you have multiple sequence alignments of four four to sequences. DNA sequence in this case, and you can see here that, and you sort it on the start side here. So you have the TA, TA, the tata box. But you can see that the A is actually 100% conserved in some layer. But in the minus 2 and the 0 position, it's not always T, it can be A sometimes also. And in the, so in the one position, it's an A, but it doesn't, it's not always, it can be T also. So you can be able to mix with this. This, of course, could be because of wrong alignments, or something, you know, but this is what the data shows you. And you see that this minus C position is completely uninteresting, has basically no information at all. I guess A is the most frequent amino acid, uh, frequent type. And you can also see that in position 2 and 3, it's, of course, not so important as this position here, but still, it's, it's really preference to be A and T. You can see much more frequent, much less frequent. So really, this is a very visual way of saying what is the important features of, 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 of a letter. It gets a bit difficult to see if you have 800 amino acids next to each other, if they all are more or less the same, but you can really highlight very easily uh, what you want to do. So, if you want to do a predictor of uh, tether boxes, we basically want to recognize these kind of patterns. And in principle, we can do a profile, a PS, uh, machine uh, side loss profile or in the market model to do this. But one thing is that they don't really include the negative examples. We really want, to, we want to separate things, then they're not always perfect. And sometimes these don't even co uh, include correlations. <coughs> we say, assume that there was a position here, there was a T, and if it was a T here, you won't have an A here, but if you have a T here, you won't have an A here. This type of information is not in a profile or actually in a market model in the way we talked about it last week. So this is one thing to use machine learning. Let's recognize this. So we basically want to identify these type of sequences compared to everything else. So what you want to do then is basically you want to present for the computer these patterns both as a positive and negative examples, both the ones that have data boxes and the ones that do not have. So a positive and negative example. And use a machine learning method so that we're going to read about here. 
and then we can classify them different things. So before we start going through a little bit more detail, let's take some terms for machine learning and go through them. So one thing you can do is you can have as um, it's what you have is classification. So basically say yes or no. So is this a data box or not? I mean, so that, that is classification. This is often in mathematics this problem. Is this this type of protein, or is this a helix or not? Or is this a helix or beta sheet? Or, or it, it doesn't have to be two classes; it can be ten classes. It's the very sun you're raining. But you can also do regression. We can maybe want predict the temperature outside. What is the temperature? Give me some variables. And then, uh, so you want to say, okay, we want to say the temperature today, even how much sun we have and what time of the year it is and the humidity is 32 degrees. And, but then it's, it's called regression. The methods are basically the same, but it's just, if you here basically have zero one classification, here you have a number that is often between zero and one. As you asked before, normally what we do is we go supervised learning Basically, you know that this is yes, and this is no. This is a tata box, this is not a tata box, this is a protein, this is not a protein, or whatever. But you also have, you do also sometimes what's called unsupervised learning. You're basically trying to find patterns, and you have the data, and you try to cluster, basically cluster the data together in some smart way. And then afterwards, you want to say, right, well, what, how did this clustering happening? Can we say something about this group that is in one group compared to another group? There's also same supervised learning methods. Basically, you have a mix of these things, and which is also the case in biology that you know some cases, but most of the data is unknown. So you really don't know about uh, all data. So you can have methods you can use. It's basically trying to find things that are similar to these label labeled ones, and then the rest can be similar to that, but you don't really know. So you have kind of half half end. These are, I would say, that most of it we use is this type of method. But these things exist also. So if, if you think about the whole thing from a bit of a statistical perspective, we can take an example. I think this was a case where you have, um, it doesn't really matter, but it's, um, we want to predict if people get heart attacks uh, or some cardiac problems uh, or not. And we have two variables. We have the, uh, high density and low density lipo proteins, whatever you have. So you have basically two meshes from the blood, and you can divide. This is a small subset. We can divide the patients that get cardiac problems or the ones that do not. So this is two input variables, and you want to separate these into two groups. And from just a pure mathematical point of view. You can see that you could actually just yes, put a line here. You do a quite good separation, but you miss this one. This one, or you put a line here. A little bit of a put line, maybe like that, of course. You find all of these, but you also find all of the false positive ones. Maybe this is, uh, but somehow a good line could be somehow separating over here. Of course, you can, you can, you can use other data, so you can have mRNA data, mRNA2 data, so measure some gene expression data. So, of course, normally you don't have two data on mRNA, so you measure 20,000 genes at the same time. So, you want to find some way to separate these two groups. And, uh, so, and in particular, what you want to do is that in the future, when someone comes to ask you with a new point, yeah. So but someone has a new patient and they ask you, will this person get cardiac problem or not? You get, you get heart problems or not? And you have these measures. In this case, you say, well, it's probably quite likely that he, that he or she will get it. But it's not obvious. But it depends a little bit on how you did this division. So at least if you did a simple definition, you will have just a simple line. Separating in this case, you would classify this person as 
having a high risk of getting cardiac problems. Which might be sad to know, but might be helpful. Well, alternatively, you can, you can do this as, as an unsupervised learning. Then you basically would just have all your data I point here, and you would classify them to groups, so you maybe end up with this classification. And then you would see that, aha, this group is mainly people with cardiac diseases, and this is mainly things with non cardiac diseases. But this is kind of. So the question is really how do we find this line? And we have to think about that this is what we do, but not in two dimensions, we do it maybe in 20,000 dimensions. And we can also think about what is the way to represent things here. Here we just have one measurement. What would happen if we did this as an exponential measure, or, this as a, or we allow this to be a, not a line, but a polynomial, or something like that? We could, we could think about we could have very advanced curves that goes all like that. It's like we really could think about doing more things. And in principle, this is actually what machine learning does. It, it, it tries to fit the line here. There are different, particularly these method called support vector machines that exactly does, does this. But you have a trick there, which you have, is that you have a function that actually transforms even this two dimensional space into a multi dimensional space. You can add much better separation. But we start with the classical machine learning method called artificial neural networks. It's, it's an old method, it's one of the first ones. But it is uh, has actually because many of these um, deep learning methods that are popular now actually are based on these ideas. So it has kind of a revival. But the idea is basically what the, where the na name comes from that you want to represent the way that the brain works, so the, the neurons work. Mathematically, you can map it to other things also. So basically, mathematically, it's not only that, but it's, it's one way to do it. So I will uh, go through a little bit how they work, and I will give you at least one example. Uh, and then later I will come back to talk about some, some other problems on later. So in particular we talk about, about one type of artificial neural network called the feed forward neural networks. So the idea is basically that you somehow should be similar to the brain. And uh, so you want to make artificial neurons and make them learn and generalize. So if you want to teach this, this artificial brain, not, not only to recognize, it's kind of easy for them to recognize that. You gotta say, if I see this, I, I, I gotta click to that. But what, what, what you want to do, so you know, it's not difficult. If you have this problem here, say, if you are at this spot here, it's going to be a uh, triangle. If you are at this spot, it's going to be a star. You can just tell, basically, whatever, whatever, you, whatever you've seen before. The key thing is, like, you want to do a good prediction of whatever hasn't been seen before, exactly. So if you just have enough dimension to describe it, you can always classify everything perfectly. It's not a problem. It's just, if I see this pattern, I say that it's that. But the key thing is you want to generalize these things and make it... Uh, Useful. So in the Go game here, you want to say, okay, I haven't seen exactly this board before, but it looks like that. Therefore, I should put my my marble in this position. So this generalize is a key thing here. So the key here because we recognize the type of sequence motif, and uh, then we want to tell you maybe what the secondary structure is, or where in the cell that we're going to talk a bit about. Cells, um, signal peptides that tells you, uh, like labels that you were in a cell, certain amino acids, sugar, certain protein sugar. But the key here is obviously we want to describe it actually, at least until this deep learning matters to come, we want to describe it to be <coughs> the biology in such a good way as possible. So, as the idea, the idea was basically that you have some kind of artificial neural, ne neural network. So, the key thing here is basically a neuron. Which in a simplified model is 
Oh, this is what is Baroni first. Actually, this is a simplified mod, uh, neuron. In more or less how it looks like. It's a cell body and there's a long axis here. And basically, it has a lot of inputs. You have uh, inputs that can be positive and negative, they have different importance, but a lot of inputs. And basically, when these inputs become strong enough, it's going to fire a signal to the next layer. So this is basically how a neuron works in, in, in biology. Exactly how it does it, or we, and, and what's the time spans, and there's actually going to be a lot of biology here, how these ions flow, flow out in this. I mean, it's not really relevant for what we want to talk about today. So instead, we want to do this as a mathematical function. So basically, we have a node here, and we have a lot of inputs. They kind of different weights. And then, the output of this node sort of depends on these inputs. So it can be a simple sum of them. More, more common is that you have kind of a, a sigmoidal function or a, yes, a cutoff function if they are strong enough, if you put up the one, otherwise if they are uh, below the cutoff it's zero. But uh, you, can, you can do it the way you want. And then you have many of these, and particularly you have hidden layers. You have maybe input layers, hidden layers, and output layer. So if we have this, we can basically give them the inputs here and then put the outputs. And then we can train it. Give, say we want to recognize helixes, we put a lot of sequences and a lot of helices here. And say that and all sequences that does not look like in the helices. And we try to make the output as good as possible to separate these two groups. So it's quite similar to this real biology, well, sort of simplified biological neural network. Neural network. Looks quite much like, like the for, uh, like in neural network, yes. There are advanced neural networks that have uh, uh, can go back and forth, etc. Et 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 so on. Even these, these deep learning networks, they're basically the same thing, except that you still have maybe two or three layers, you have 40 layers or 30 layers. And they're trained in slightly different ways, because in the traditional way you can't really train 30 layers, because it doesn't work. So, hmm. So to simplify things, you have to have an in layer, a hidden layer, or one or two or a few hidden layers, and an output layer. An output layer can be zero, one, or it can be two, it can be one, it can be, it can be two numbers, etc. Depends what you want to have. So. You have to decide when you make it if you want to have what kind of function you want to have here, and often you use either sigmoidal or a just a cutoff function. Just the sum of them is not very useful because then you can basically just say the sum, but often it's more useful to have something like to transform it a little bit. So either just a cutoff or a uh, sigmoidal function. So one example that is quite good when, when you say why, why not simple statistics works when actually neural network works works is the XOR problem. Do you know what XOR is? So basically, it's a very, very simple biological mathematical problem. Well, that's biological mathematical. So you know, and so in, in, in the philosophy, what we have, and, or, and not. So if you have it in numbers, and one is positive, so we have number one and number two. So. And uh, let's do it like this instead. We have and, or, and not. And well, this can be either uh, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So if it's and, of course, then it both need to be 1. So it's going to be zero, the output is going to be 0, 0, 1. So if, if I and my sister needs to go skiing, then, we, then it's only true with both of the same. If I or, of course, if me or my sister will go skiing, it's true if one of us will go skiing. So basically, it's zero here, and one in every case, others. Uh, right, not something, not the same thing, you can have a not something, but that's some. But we also have XOR. So XOR means that it's. If me or my sister, 
but only one of us goes skiing, then it's true. So, should we have outputs that are like that? So, if you think about this in a diagram like this, you have a zero and one, and this is zero and one. This is the um, two n one and n two. This is n one, this is n two. The n function is also like basically would have zero zero one like that. So you can easily make a line like that if the, the, the sum sim simple. If the sum if the sum of these two numbers is greater than one point five, you can go. That's easy. <coughs> The or the same thing if you, you don't have one one zero like that. So if the sum of these two numbers is uh, higher than uh, 0.5, it should be one. But in this case of the XOR, we can't really find a simple linear curve that separates these two things. Because it doesn't really work. You could maybe do something else, but it's kind of like a linear plane that separates these two groups. But a neural network can do it. So this is somehow an illustration of this. Not that nice, but your dark things are ones here, so there should be one here, and zero should be there. So if you make a neural network with these numbers that I have in this kind of little demonstration here, it actually works. So you have the input here, input here. And we uh, have two hidden layers, this is the input layer, so this is the input 0, 1. And from then the output layer. So if you put a cutoff, if I get it right, 1.0 here, and this is the weights, 1.0, the weights are always 1.0. But you have cutoffs that are minus 0.5 and minus 1.5. And here you have a weight of minus 2.0, and here you have 1.0. So this means that if I put in my alternative inputs are 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0. So this one is here. So if I take the zero, zero, I might take zero, multiply by one, which is zero, and I multiply, the, so basically all the inputs here are zero. Mm. And I take zero minus 1.5, it's going to be less than zero. <coughs> so we, we have here, here we have, the first time we zero, zero, here the inputs are zero, zero. So the output here means that it's uh, basically, uh, it's less than zero, it's going to be output, going to be, it's going to be output here can be zero and zero also. And so that means that the output here is going to be zero. Because zero times minus two, zero times minus one. And the cutoff of this last one is minus over five also. But if I instead have one zero one, then I'm going to get one of the input of both of these. And the and one is actually higher than minus 0.5. Well, 1 minus 0 0.5 is higher than 0. So means that this one is going to fire. I have input at 1, but this one is not. Because it's a, so the hyper here, I, uh, it's a number here. So I have 0, 1 here. And then I have 0, uh, I have 1, 1 as input here. Both of these are inputs of 1. I top one, and then I'm going to have 0, and this one is going to have 1. And I have 1 minus 0 0.5 is actually it's higher than 0, so I'm going to have 1 as an output. And the next one is actually the same, of course, because we have the same input, so it doesn't really matter how you start it. But if I, if I have 1, 1, input 0, 1, and 1, so you have 2 as input to both of these. So I have 2 here and 2 here, and 2 there. And 2 minus 1.5 is actually larger than 0. So that means they're going to have minus 2 here as this file, and this one is going to be still be 1. But minus 2 plus 1 minus 
is less than uh, zero. Means that variable C is not positive. So basically, I, 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 I can get the neural networks that, that can be used to classify an XOR problem. Can you decide these cutoffs? Like the in this case, I have decided them myself. So the idea is, of course, this is in this case, I have decided them. But what you do is exactly what, what, you, try, what you should do is to, you, you should train it. So in a normal case, you would tell them the inputs like that. And you will say what I want in the output piece. In this case, I wanted it to be, I wanted it to be trained. I give them these examples, and now it's only four possible examples. But you say I give them millions of these examples, and then the computer should figure out this itself. And basically, what I do is basically I, I, I put some random numbers here in the middle, uh, and. Uh, if so basically I have if I have the correct answer that I fix that output, so basically I wanted that and I calculate the difference between this number. So and then I modify my weights step by step backwards so to improve this uh, difference. <coughs> so how you do this many cycles of training. Well not a really simple problem, but uh, so well if the correct answer in this case is correct answer is, is zero, then I and I have the one, and I have the adjusted so you get close to zero. So I need many training examples. But in this case, for example, there are no more cases. So no, in this case, is not. Yeah. But uh, it, could it happen that you have a problem? So because for this. Uh, so the key is about well, the, the key. As I say, the key, key is basically I have more f variables. I have like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten variables, and I have only four inputs. That is kind of is the over-determined system. I, mean, I can't determine it. Nothing. So the key thing is basically that you need to have is many training examples. <coughs> so yeah, I mean normally, so certainly you have more than two two variables thing as an input, but otherwise that doesn't make sense. But, but also you need all the training examples. So basically the trick, trick is like this. So you start with some random weights here. So you have a lot, lot of training examples as you show them. Start with some random weights. You show one example and ca calculate output, so whatever, you, you start something random that is completely not going to work. But, uh, and you calculate the output errors, the difference between observing the desired output. So you can be one or zero here, basically. Uh, either it's correct or it's not correct. Or you can minus one or plus one, maybe. And then uh, you use what's called the back propagation algorithm. You basically try to calculate, the, 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 the minimize it on your way back, all the steps. So how much, how much does this change? The output by changing this variable, and you use these aggregates, and you adjust the weights, and then you repeat this for all inputs, and then you repeat this whole thing for a loop of everything. Uh, so you show the same inputs many times. So, yeah, in example two, it doesn't really make sense, but a big example is just keep on training. Okay. So basically, the, the difference. Uh, it's basically this algorithm here is not really used. I mean, the, the, the new types of deep learning algorithms, this al algorithm is too slow, you can't use it. They have other algorithms that use that are more, it's not really, you basically calculate them more ad hoc much faster. But you understand that you have, you have many, many input layers, uh, examples, and you have more layers in between, it actually works. Um, So this is how a neural network could work, and at least idea how it could be trained. We'll, we'll show more practical examples in a while. I just want to show you the other method that is at least we have been using more and more lately, and that's mostly what like what you're going to use in the project course later. This is called support by machines. Uh, so basically, it's just back to this old experiment here that has one separate the green and the blue, red dots. And you have an n-dimensional space, and actually, a neural network can be considered as a spe special case. You can, you can actually map this type of description to a neural network. So it's in principle, it could be the same problem. A neural network is a subset of this problem. So you want to separate, a, find a, a line or a hyperplane, if you are more than two dimensions. So it's a plane that separates these two uh, set of groups. 
So you want to separate one from another. And you want to have uh, uh, so you can describe this plane as as a set of vectors. We have a hyper plane is kept a set of these vectors. Uh, X i vectors, which is basically a set of vectors spans the plan like any other plane, but it's many dimensions. Uh, and this can actually be found. It's just basically find the weights of each, ve each vector and uh, some factors offset it, and you can find it. And there, but actually, it actually might exist many planes that that are separated perfectly. In this case, you see this, all these lines.